Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, currently a research assistant at the Center for Psychedelic Research in London. And my work there for the past one and a half years has consisted mostly of coordinating research with psychedelic experience providers around the world. So we've been running an observational online study that has allowed us within the last 18 months or so to collect uh, what is at least to my knowledge the largest um, data set the largest prospective data set on guided psychedelic experiences, allowing us for a first time to um, model statistically how all these messy contextual variables that we usually know as set and setting influence both the acute psychedelic state and its long-term outcomes. But perhaps to start with a little bit of conceptual background. On the most fundamental level, we can investigate the human living experiencing being from two perspectives. A doctor who's using an instrument like a stethoscope or a brain scanner takes a third person perspective to the human body as an autopoietic system composed of physiological processes. This can yield fascinating results on a mechanistic level, but will not give you much information on the conscious subjective experience of the person who's inhabiting this body. So when you're, on the other hand, when your colleague will ask you uh, next week, how did you like the um, inside conference after party, uh, we're almost there. Um, he will take a second person stance towards your experience. He wants to know how uh, you and your lived your experience, but it's um, uh, experience that night. Uh, you can then take an introspective first person stance and try to recollect those memories, if there are any left, um, and uh, give a recollection of your experience. The microphenomenological interview method, for example, that Raphael Millier presented on two days ago in a workshop, does that on a very kind of structured, scientifically, scientifically rigorous level. Uh, and inasmuch as a brain in isolation without a body around that can tell about its experience does not, um, is not going to tell you much about uh, its conscious experience, we as human beings also generally don't exist in a vacuum. But instead, we are usually embedded in dynamically changing environments, such as the seminar room here, which, whether you are aware of it or not, influences the way that you experience the world and that you interact with the world. This uh, lift space in uh, taking a third-person perspective is usually not much more than a confounder. So in a brain imaging study, for example, you're generally not interested in intervention X, um, uh, the effects of intervention X on someone lying in the noisy metal tube. That's just a necessary and often disregarded limitation of the methodology itself. And as fascinating as these third-person approaches are, I would like to argue that to really understand the lived psychedelic experience, we also need to understand the lived spaces in which these experiences generally occur. The problem now with that is that these environments are incredibly rich and potentially determined by an unlimited amount of different variables and factors. So it's very difficult to operationalize this. A solution for this that we chose to go after is looking at settings where these contextual variables are somewhat curated and structured, which brings me to uh, psychedelic ceremonies. Fortunately for us, these have been growing um, massively in popularity over the past 10 years or so. These are like Google Trend searches for ayahuasca retreats over the last 10 years, for example, or here for psychedelic retreats. Uh, you see the publication date of Michael Pollan's book that led to quite a spike. Um, so lots of psychedelic retreats in the Netherlands uh, working with psilocybin that have been popping up over the last two years or so. Um, looking at some previous research that was done on um, these type of ceremonial settings. Uh, I'd like to bring your attention to a paper by Trichter from 2009, which was quite interesting insofar as it actually, for the first time, really investigated differences between a natural and a um, urban setting. So he looked at two groups of ayahuasca drinkers, one in a remote natural area in Canada, and then one urban setting in a church in California and found actually that in the remote natural setting, people had stronger peak experiences and more positive long-term outcomes. Then there are two um, papers by Marlene Utok, who's sitting here in the front row waiting to give her talk next, um, that have also investigated uh, psychedelics, specifically ayahuasca and 5-methoxy-DMT in different environments, found that um, the acute psychedelic experience had an influence on long-term outcomes. However, uh, that this influence was not different based on whether um, the psychedelic was taken in a traditional Colombian setting, for example, or in a modern European setting. So this is exactly what we were interested in with the current study. Could we predict psychological long-term outcomes based on set and setting? 
We chose this three-step approach for this, first trying to see if we could re replicate the positive um, findings from uh, previous research on uh, 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 psychological outcomes, then if we could predict these psychological outcomes based on the acute psychedelic state, and lastly, if we could then in turn predict the acute psychedelic state based on factors like uh, psychological traits, um, the readiness, the pre-state right before a ceremony, and the ceremony design. We were able to do so um, through this uh, uh, website that was designed by two Danish guys, Kenneth Young and Nikolai Lassen, uh, who set it up for us. So if you go on psychedelicsurvey.com, you will see that there are currently uh, four studies running. One of them, the uh, ceremony study that I'm talking about today, then there's one on uh, psychedelic use in any kind of uh, non-guided setting, a microdosing survey, and then a very funky designed um, self-blinding microdosing study where people don't actually know if they take a microdosing or not, uh, if, they take a mic if they take a microdose or not, uh, and then only after the microdosing protocol get the solution where, when they've actually been taking microdose and when, when they haven't. So if you're planning to do a microdosing protocol or take a psychedelic in any other setting, please consider signing up for one of these studies. But for now, let's take a closer look at the ceremony survey. Um, so when people signed up for the ceremony study, they did first receive a baseline questionnaire two weeks before their indicated ceremony date, uh, followed by one questionnaire right before the ceremony, so within the 24 hours before, assessing the readiness, the preparedness, and also the connection that people have built until then with the ceremony facilitators and other participants. Then after the ceremony, there's an acute experience assessment, so in retrospect, how did the psychedelic experience actually play out, followed by um, a repetition of these two questionnaire questionnaires, depending on how many ceremonies uh, occurred within the course of a retreat, because many retreats also have multiple ceremonies over a couple of days. Then um, one questionnaire on the day after leaving the ceremony location, followed by two endpoints uh, at two weeks, at four weeks, and a follow-up at six months post-retreat or ceremony. Uh, we started collecting data on Bicycle Day last year and have since then signed up more than a thousand participants from uh, more than 60 ceremony locations around the world, 637 of whom as of last week have completed our baseline measures. Then we have a quite massive attrition, so at the key endpoint only about 40% of the participants um, are left. Looking at the demographics, we see that the sample is quite gender balanced. The age is fairly high, so with an average age of 43, this is a lot higher than you would usually see in kind of observational psychedelic research. Um, most of them are highly educated and employed. Perhaps the first psychedelic study where you have more retirees in your sample than students. Um, most of them came from the US and the UK, predominantly white. Um, another interesting aspect about this sample is that 40% of the entire participant population never had a psychedelic experience before. So they really reported their very first lifetime psychedelic experience here, that despite the high age. Um, uh, psychiatric history is something that's worth unpacking a bit more, so of the 32% of participants that reported a lifetime psychiatric diagnosis, um, most suffered from a major depression, uh, from a depressive disorder or anxiety disorder. Many of uh, those also indicated that they were participating in the ceremony with a specific intention to treat that disorder. Uh, interestingly, there were also 16 participants who suffered from either bipolar or psychotic disorders, uh, which is, as you might know, um, usually a contraindication for psychedelic treatments. So this raises slight concerns about the pre-screening methods that the experienced providers uh, around the world are, are using. Uh, coming to the retreats themselves, uh, most of our data come, came from psilocybin truffle or mushroom retreats, uh, then about a third of the data from ayahuasca, um, uh, ceremonies and retreats in South America, and a few reports on mescaline, DMT, LSD ceremonies, but these were really marginal numbers. The formats were mostly for psilocybin, three-day retreats with one ceremony. The second most common was seven-day retreats with three ceremonies. For ayahuasca, you usually had uh, retreats that got, went on for more than a week and had five or more uh, ceremonies in succession. Looking at the results now, our main psychological outcome was the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, which is a very well validated measure for um, psychological well-being, which was, as you can see, significantly increased um, two weeks, four weeks, and also still six months after the ceremony experience. So to put these numbers in some context, the um, population norm in the UK, for example, is around a 50. If you can count yourself to the privileged 20% in the highest income quintile, your uh, WEMWEBs will be pushed to around a 52, so two points higher. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, people 85 above are around, a, around a, uh, 48. So um, we don't know how the Queen is doing, uh, especially given the um, current political circumstances. What we do know is that the psychedelic ceremony or retreat pushed our uh, sample from below the level of an 85-year-old living in a precarious neighborhood to um, yeah, above the population norm. I also tried to look up the values for Germany. Uh, unfortunately, could only find a German validation of the WEMWEBs in an Austrian sample. So these are the numbers for Vienna, well beyond anything you see in the UK. Uh, also, what you see uh, after a psychedelic ceremony. So ayahuasca is good, but uh, a well-functioning coffeehouse culture also seems to have its benefits. <laughs> Um, kind of reflecting, reflecting these results, we also see uh, significant decreases in depressive symptoms, so lowering the average of the sample from the bottom end of a mild depression to clearly non-depressed territory here. As you might expect, longer retreats had more um, significant changes on well-being, so um, here at four weeks post-ceremony or post-retreat, um, those participants that underwent multiple ceremonies rather than a single one um, saw stronger increases in well-being. Comparing psilocybin and ayahuasca, the extent of change was not different. However, the ayahuasca participants were slightly higher in well-being across the different time points, which only came out as significant at baseline. Um, now coming to the predictive model of um, acute psychedelic state on those long-term outcomes. We used here a battery of well-validated psychometric questionnaires tapping into mystical type experiences, challenging experiences, emotional breakthrough, um, which refers to a type of uh, resolution or dealing with challenging, difficult emotions, the ego dissolution inventory, and to assess visual effects, the uh, visual restructuralization subscale of the 11-dimensional altered states of consciousness questionnaire. As we were confronted here with quite unique settings in that um, we have uh, a group of multiple people taking a psychedelic together. We also included some uh, measures on collective experience. So uh, the emotional synchrony scale taps into um, uh, the, the, per the perception of a shared emotion between the participants. Um, communitas is a construct that comes from social anthropology and denotes the state of a community that undergoes a shared experience together um, that leads to a temporary um, yeah, lifting of, of the social structures. Those social structures become irrelevant. People can experience each other based on a basic shared humanity rather than their social roles. And that leads then to a collective state of harmony and joy among the participants. It's a theory. In case of multiple ceremonies, we ended up using the highest score on any of these subscales uh, across the ceremonies of the retreat per participant. So we tested this now by uh, oh, no, let's first look at the interrelations. So here, this is a correlation heat map of the different um, psych uh, acute experience scales and their subscales. So you see in the, in the top left corner that um, the social experience scales are very nicely intercorrelated. So are the visual and mystical experience scales. Emotional breakthrough is an interesting one here in the middle as it's both correlated with the peak experience, but then also at least with one subs subscale of the challenging experience questionnaire, which is grief. So it seems to be kind of wedged in between um, challenging and the, the peak experience, making it um, yeah, some type of a difficult peak experience in a way. Um, looking now how these different scales predict long-term outcomes, we saw that uh, emotional breakthrough was the strongest predictor of well-being changes across time. Uh, also reflected by the strongest uh, correlation between emotional breakthrough inventory and change scores between baseline and two weeks post-ceremony. Uh, interestingly, when also introducing substance as a factor, we saw a significant three-way interaction between substance, time, and the emotional break breakthrough inventory, meaning that depending on whether people took ayahuasca or psilocybin, the effects of emotional breakthrough experiences on long-term outcomes were different. And indeed, only for psilocybin did the correlation between um, the emotional breakthrough and long-term changes remain significant, whereas for ayahuasca it seemed that um, ego dissolution and collective experiences played a bigger role and were stronger associated with changes in uh, psychological well-being. Now, predicting the acute psychedelic state based on contextual variables. Here, 
in the first step, we measured um, some baseline traits. So the absorption questionnaire, MOTAS, for example, absorption refers to the personality trait to get easily absorbed into um, an activity, external stimuli, like a beautiful sunset, or also one's own mental imagery. Um, a questionnaire on suggestibility, one on adverse childhood experiences, so traumatic experiences in the first 18 years of age, um, a big five personality inventory, uh, trait anxiety, and a self-constructed questionnaire on intention to participate in the ceremony. Um, to measure the pre-state right before the experience, we use the so-called psychological predictor scale, which measures, measures readiness and um, the rapport that's built with the facilitators and other participants. And lastly, to tap into a setting, we um, included a few items after the acute experience asking how did certain elements of the ceremony design influence your overall experience or how actively did you participate in things like live singing, chanting, dancing, conversations and so on. Um, we now tested how these different factors affected the acute psychotic state by running multivariate regression models. So here, um, for example, for intentions, we saw that spiritual intentions increases various of the um, acute experience subscales, most strongly mystical and ego dissolution, as well as collective experiences, whereas therapeutic intentions led to stronger breakthrough experiences, but also to stronger challenging experiences. Um, Readiness right before the uh, session let, decreased the amount of challenging experiences as you would expect and the uh, degree of kind of connectedness and security with the facilitators and the other participants led to stronger collective and also breakthrough experiences in the sample. Looking at personality traits, absorption really increased the psychedelic experience across the board on many different scales, which is corresponding with previous research. Um, extraversion was the only personality factor that had a significant effect, here decreasing challenging experiences. Anxiety, on the other hand, increased challenging experiences. And uh, a very interesting finding also, uh, we could show for the first time in this large sample that uh, traumatic experiences before 18 years of age had an influence on how the acute psychedelic experience plays out. So something that is kind of fairly well known in the community but not, ha hasn't ever really been tested uh, systematically. So these experiences for the average participants are more than 25 years ago, um, something to kind of keep in mind. Looking at uh, setting variables, the strongest one across the board were the presence of uh, supportive individuals, kind of indicating how people who feel that well supported are probably um, having an easier time just settling in and letting go into the experience. Uh, on the other hand, the perception of threat and distractions during ceremony decreased collective experience and increased challenging experiences. Uh, in terms of music, a more reliable predictor was actually the presence of recorded music uh, compared to uh, live chanting or live music, increasing um, mystical experiences, experiences of ego dissolution, and also um, synesthetic uh, visual experiences. Activities were slightly uh, weaker predictors of um, the acute psychedelic state. Just to point out here, singing is also something that apparently kind of in enhances the psychedelic experiences on various, on various levels. In summary, we could so um, see how contextual variables uh, set and setting through um, the acute experience has an effect on long-term outcomes, specifically through the facilitation of emotional breakthroughs, which was strongest predicted by the presence and the perceived influence of supportive individuals in these ceremonial settings. Now, before ending this presentation, I want to give a brief outlook uh, where we want to go with this research. So, one of the things is that we want to diversify the type of data that we're collecting by also collecting cognitive and biometric data. Here, specifically interested in testing the Rebus model of relaxed beliefs under psychedelics, um, seeing if belief updating pre-post the psychedelic ceremony would change, and also track uh, autonomous physiological responses. One of these here, um, that's now measuring how much I'm freaking out during my presentation. Um, the second thing is um, that we currently seed funding to uh, turn psychedelic survey into a mobile application, not only with the goal to make data collection even easier, but also to give something back to the users. So the idea here is, um, on one hand, of course, to create a harm reduction tool that can provide information to, to the individual psychonaut or uh, psychedelic ceremony attendee. 
um, but at the same time also use that individual psychological data to perhaps tailor the experiences, give individualized recommendations on what kind of practices, what kind of techniques might be useful for the individual, like meditation or journaling after psychedelic experiences, also linked to integration support services like the one that's being set up by the Mind Foundation. Um, and hopefully um, make this also a pre-screening tool that could raise red flags if someone indicates something like a psychotic disorder, both for the individual and also for um, experienced providers like retreat settings. After a study block, we would then give an individual feedback like a data report to the user so people can actually track how they develop throughout their psychedelic journeys, how they change on a psychological level and um, share this with their friends. Um, Uh, lastly, yeah, what we are hoping to achieve with this in the long term is to uh, run more uh, sophisticated uh, statistical models that will allow us to then tailor make both in therapeutic settings but also in naturalistic um, kind of experience provision settings like in, in retreat settings, tailor make psychedelic experiences to know, you know, who might need specific attention and um, what kind of, yeah, uh, design elements might be particularly useful for what type of individual. Um, lastly, in this specific context of group experiences, this is also hoped to inform the development of group therapy trials um, in the long run. So now all that's left for me is to thank my supervisors, Robin Card harris Leo Roseman, and the rest of our wonderful team, as well as um, Kenneth Young, who's been making all this possible, the many retreat centers who allowed us to collect data from their participants, as well as, of course, the community itself for filling out hundreds and hundreds of hours of questionnaire material. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting research you're doing. Uh, would you take some couple of questions? Of course, sure. If you have time. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, do you know the data that came in was from the are you concerned that some of the results will be universalized across the board when they may not be as effective for folks of color who are doing these retreats? Mm. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, it's it's hard to say because we just don't have the data. Um, but um, I would think that as more is coming in. Um, we'll be able to give a better answer to that question. There is some interesting research going on at the moment, more in controlled settings, specifically um, using psychedelics with people of color. Um, but I'm not completely aware whether there's like different treatment models, for example, that people are using um, or kind of taking into account different aspects there. Um, there's also a few retreats that are now starting to specialize, for example, on yeah, just retreats for, for people of color, for people of different backgrounds. Uh, I mean, there's many women retreats specifically for women, for example. Um, so yeah, it would be an interesting research setting to see like, whether these actually work different than just the yeah, large sample that we're collecting here. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, thanks for the very interesting talk and the data. And I have a question. Did you include in your research the preparation of kind of ceremony? Because in Ayahuasca people say for one week you don't get to eat that or mm. alcohol. Did you track it? Because that would be really surprised if there are really different yeah, uh, we actually collect some data on dieting uh, before the retreat or before the ceremony. Uh, I haven't looked at it yet, unfortunately, so I can't really tell you whether there's uh, uh, something something in there. Um, we also, for example, look at um, this idea of purging in ayahuasca, uh, how much people feel like whatever physiological reactions they have to the substance um, is uh, something that feels cleansing. And this is something that correlated highly, for example, with the experience of emotional breakthroughs. So um, there seems to be something to these uh, kind of cultural ideas of, you know, um, how to conceptualize and how to make meaning of certain aspects of these experiences. And I think dieting in the end is also just something that will raise the intention and kind of, um, yeah, make people more prepared just because it kind of keeps bringing back the idea of I'm going to do something and I'm preparing for it at the moment into their head with every meal. Um, so I, I'm, I would be fairly confident that it will have an effect, yeah. But you said in the future you would collect data from more 
this logical sense of being from the micro HOV. Yeah. So they can really track or combine it with the physiological preparation and the connectivity. Yeah. One more question. Yeah, thanks. Um, considering that uh, the psych uh, therapeutic relationship is something that is stressed is very important for therapy in this conference, I'm curious that your study shows that live music is less effective mm. than recorded music. I was wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, I think um, it has to do with the specific settings and ceremonies from which we were collecting. Of course, we have a kind of biased sample in the sense that some centers provided a lot of data, others provided less data. Um, I think the, record, the use of recorded music just allows to curate very, very specifically a narrative, a journey, um, which I guess to the predominantly wide sample that we have here or like resin sample that we have here might be more accessible uh, and kind of create a bigger resonance uh, than some forms of live music. Um, so, yeah, that's all I can give you as an answer. Uh, sort of, I think, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, essentially, I mean, usually these um, facilitators then prepare a playlist kind of in advance. And uh, I mean, this is kind of very well uh, designed to kind of really deliver a specific type of experience in most cases. Um, so I would think through that preparation is pro probably easier, especially for a Western population to kind of just resonate with whatever narrative is introduced through the, through the aspect of music.